Well, take your Bibles and move with me to go with me to Luke chapter eight, if you will. Luke chapter eight, and uh, I want to uh, take you to uh, a story that the more I read it and the more I study it, I'm going to give you three words that describe this story to me. Okay, here they are. In all of the Bible, it is one of the most sad, one of the most beautiful, and one of the most disappointing stories you will ever read. Okay? Sad, beautiful, and disappointing. By the way, this is one of the reasons I believe the Bible to be true. The Bible doesn't just tell a story like Disney tells a story, right, where everybody lives, finish it for me happily ever after. It has this wonderful expression that takes people in some of their deepest, darkest places shows how beautiful God is in that regard, and then goes beyond that to actually show you how others may not respond. It's sad because of the condition of the person who we're going to read about briefly. It's beautiful because of what Jesus does. It's disappointing because of the response of those in the town and in the community. I'll pick up the reading in Luke chapter 8 at verse 26, and here we read, Then they sailed to the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded, that is Jesus, the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter there. So he gave them permission, and then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to find, they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he, that is Jesus, got into the boat and returned. And the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. When you begin to read this passage, you begin to understand that there is a real spiritual battle. And I guess to some degree there is a sadness there when you begin to see people who have succumbed in that spiritual battle. By the way, all of us have been there at some stage in our life. We may not have known a demon possession like this man had, but we have certainly known what it's like to have been challenged, to face difficulties, to have faced battles. And I just want to remind you again that when you begin to read the Bible, you're going to understand a lot of those battles are spiritual battles. They are happening behind the scenes. You and I see what happens on the surface, But those things are driven by issues behind us, as is revealed in this particular passage. Let me give you just a few ideas about the spiritual battle that is real, and we find them in this text, okay? The spiritual battle that is real. Here's the first one. The loneliness is real. This is a man who had lived in no longer in a home, no longer in a house, but had lived out and among the tombs. In fact, this story is also told in Matthew and Mark, and there we recount that sometimes he would attack people who came into the area. Can you imagine? Just think about this for a second. You go over to Eglinton Cemetery for a funeral, and there is a man running around in that cemetery attacking people. This was his condition. Anybody got close, he pushed them back. In fact, in the Matthew account, 
We read that there were actually two men, two men who came out from the tombs demon-possessed, but this is the only one who begins to have the discussion with Jesus. This is the one. So here's how I look at that. Even when there was another person with him, this man still struggled with great loneliness. By the way, if you think that most people who are engaging with other people aren't lonely, you haven't thought about that properly. Sometimes I think the loneliest people are those who are in the crowd, but not really revealing who they are in the crowd. You don't have to be alone to be lonely. In fact, here's the picture of the man. I love J.A. Brooks' understanding of it. He speaks of it this way. This is a picture of a man in a pitiful state. He could not live with his family, so he lived alone in a graveyard. He was strong enough to break the chains that bound him, but not strong enough to expel the demons from his body. His shrieking was heard throughout the countryside. He was even violent toward himself and cut himself with stones. He was naked and most likely covered with scars. Wow. You just read that picture and you think, man, you just feel badly. And he endured it all alone. Well, not exactly alone. We know that there were demons within him, so many demons that they called themselves a legion. Here, think about this for a second. There are 6,000 Roman soldiers in a legion. Now, what we know about demonic forces is they always tell a little bit of the truth, but not all the truth, right? So I think that when they say, hey, we're legion because we're many, they were many, but I don't know that they were necessarily 6,000. We do know that there, because Mark tells us that there were 2,000 pigs in the herd, 2,000 pigs rushed down the hillside and drowned in the sea. Therefore, we know that there were possibly thousands of demons possessing this man. Okay. Wow. And all of that, he had to battle alone. The loneliness is real. Let me give you another idea if we could. The hopelessness is real. You say, man, Phil, if this is the message and it's going to go like this, okay, this is going to be really bad. Sometimes you got to lay out the black backdrop in order that you can see the bright light, okay? So just stay with me. The hopelessness is real. And while I share with you these ideas, just stay with me here. Recognize that some of you are saying, probably right now, how does Phil know what I'm living? I don't. I don't know who's living what when I preach on a Sunday but the Holy Spirit does. So just stay with me because you're going to find out in a moment how the Savior is strong in spite of the fact that the spiritual battle is real. The hopelessness is real. Let me give you a couple quotes of hopelessness. I know they must be true because I found them on Instagram. Okay. Here they are. I feel like I'm waiting for something that isn't going to happen. You ever feel like that? Like you're tired of waiting because you've just waited so long you don't feel like it's going to happen. Or how about this one? My biggest fear is that eventually you will see me the way I see myself. That would be a hopeless feeling. Or how about this one? Captured in just four simple words. I'm slowly giving up. Hmm. Can you imagine? The text says in Luke chapter 8 that for a long time this man had been in the graveyard for a long time. I trace that word for a long time through the scriptures. It occurs, that phrase, it occurs about 20 times. One of the times it occurs is that wonderful story in Matthew 25 where a master gives to, a, to three stewards, one five talents, one two talents, one one talent, and then he leaves and goes away for a long time. When he comes back, the man with five talents had raised five more. The man with two talents had raised two more. And the man with one talent hadn't gotten anything. But here's the idea how long is a long time? Long enough to double your investment. For a long time, this man had lived in this condition. It was not only lonely, it was hopeless. Um, one of the songwriters I love to listen to is a guy by the name of Andrew Peterson. Peterson writes some of the most transparent, some of the most transparent songs I think I've ever heard. And one of those he writes about is the discouragement and depression that it would appear like in the song that he himself struggles with. So just think about this. Maybe these words resonate with you. I tried to be brave, but I hid in the dark. I sat in that cave and I prayed for a spark to light up all the pain that remained in my heart. And the rain kept falling. 
Down on the roof of the church where I cried, I could hear all the laughter and love. And I tried to get up and get out, but a part of me died, and the rain kept falling. I'm scared if I open myself to be known, I'll be seen and despised and be left all alone, so I'm stuck in this tomb, and you won't move the stone. And the rain keeps falling. Somewhere the sun is a light in the sky, but I'm dying in North Carolina, and I can't believe there's an end to this season of night. And the rain keeps falling, falling down, falling down. There's a woman at home, and she's praying for light. My children are there, and they love me. In spite of the shadow, I know that they see in my eyes, and the rain keeps falling. But Peterson takes that song, and he reminds us that sometimes, out of the pain and suffering, God causes things to grow. Look at this. My daughter and I put seeds in the dirt, and every day now we've been watching the earth for a sign that this death will give way to a birth, and the rain keeps falling down on the soil where the sorrow is laid, and the secret of life is igniting the grave, and I'm dying to live, but I'm learning to wait, and the rain keeps falling. I just want to be new again. I just want to be closer to you again. For just a moment... Don't apply those words to yourself or to someone you know, but apply them to what this man must have felt. For a long time, he'd been in the tombs, naked, scarred, haunted, wanting a change. We're not quite there yet. The battle is real because the fear is real. The spiritual battle is real, the loneliness is real, the hopelessness is real, the fear is real. It would seem in Luke chapter 8 that it's the demon that's speaking to Jesus when he begins to be afraid, but I would just remind you that it could as well just have been the man who's afraid. You say, well, no, Phil, that doesn't make sense. If you'd been haunted by thousands of demons for all your life, the one thing you'd want is a change. That's correct. But what I know from years of working with people is that often the very places that we are, we fear change more than we fear what we know. That's why some people struggle because their identity is tied up in their difficulty. They can't separate the two. They tell you that they want to change, but they don't really want to change. I wonder sometimes if that's how the demoniac felt. The fear is real. Not only is the fear real, but I would just remind you that the enemy is real. If you had always thought that, um, that when the Bible speaks about demons and stuff, it's, it's just kind of like a, more of kind of like, I don't know, like, like a dress-up kind of fake kind of thing. It's just what we do with goblins in the dark. I just want to remind you, that is not at all how the Bible refers to demons and Satan. These individuals talk, okay? They're not just something that's made up. Jesus speaks to them. They speak back. I remember the first time we were ministering in Haiti, um, that we, we got on the truck and we all got on the truck and we're driving out and as we're leaving the compound in Haiti to go out and build a house, there's all this commotion happening right over to our right. And um, Ron Taylor was on that truck and we said, what's happening there? And someone said to us, um, there's a man that's possessed by demons and they're jumping on him to control him, right? And I remember thinking, man, I am not in Kansas anymore, okay? This is very different. I asked the missionary who served there afterwards, I said, like, we don't see this quite in the same way in America. Um, Does this happen frequently? And he said, it happens frequently. And he went on to describe how he'd been running a children's camp and they brought in a young girl and laid her down on the table and she, he said, Phil, she was stiff as a rod and she was not, it's like she wasn't breathing, right? And all of a sudden, this deep guttural voice comes out of this 12-year-old girl and refers to her as mother. And this voice starts speaking, and he said, we start doing everything we can to get those demons out of her. We're casting demons out in Jesus' name. We're sending them anywhere we can think that's a hot place. We're trying to send them, okay? The picture is this. This is a real spiritual battle. I remember someone asking um, our pastor in California once, was demon possession higher during Jesus' time? Because there seems like there's a lot of it in the New Testament. And he said, no, it's just that Jesus could recognize it for what it was and call it out. Wow. 
We sometimes think that this isn't a real spiritual battle, but it is a real battle, and the enemy is real. And that's why we're told in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Wow. Four terms that are used there. You just want to note them again. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. Here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is Satan is not omnipresent. That means of the millions and millions of people that live in the earth, he cannot necessarily come after every single one. But here's the bad news. He has demons that can. And so there is oppression without question in this in, in this world and in the lives of those who are around us. There is great hope in Jesus. Hold on, we're getting there, okay? But I want you to feel the sense of the reality of a real spiritual battle. MacArthur Study Bible adds in this passage where it says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. To wrestle is a term used of hand-to-hand combat. Wrestling features trickery and deception like Satan and his hosts when they attack Coping with deceptive temptation requires truth and righteousness. The four designations, we just talked about those, right? Leaders and rulers and cosmic powers describe the different strata and rankings of those demons and the evil supernatural empire in which they operate. Satan's forces of darkness are highly structured for the most destructive purposes. Wow. In case you're thinking it's just a normal world, you can't, only what you can see is real. I just want to remind you that's not the presentation of the scriptures at all, at all. You say, okay, Phil, that's black enough, all right? Okay, it is, all right? So let me introduce you to this idea. The Savior is strong. The spiritual battle is real, but the Savior is strong. Go back with me to Luke chapter 8. Let me show you something. In Luke chapter 8, we read that the verses before we get into this discussion... Remember, you and I read the story in verse, like, 26, and it sounds like Jesus just sailed over there and he got out of the boat... But that's not what happened. Look at verse 22. One day, same chapter, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. I have a question for you. Why? Why does he want to go across to the other side of the lake? Depending on where he's leaving from, it's about 8 to 12 miles across the Sea of Galilee. Why is he going over there? Look with me, if you will, at Luke chapter 8. Um, The end of this paragraph that we read. Um, Remember, look with me at verse 37. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from there, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. Why? Why did he get into the boat and come across the Sea of Galilee? And why is he now, only one day later, getting back in the boat and going across again? I think the answer is evident. Because Jesus pursued a man on the other side of the lake, one man, just one man, who was broken and needed help, and Jesus intentionally went after him. By the way, you want to gain an entirely different perspective of a passage you know? Jesus goes across that lake and encounters a storm. Remember the storm, and the disciples say, hey, wake up, Jesus, we're perishing. Jesus wakes up, and he commands the sea and the waves to be still, and they are, and, it, and it's basically peace, be still, and they are. Even the waves and sea obey him. Here's what I want you to see. He pursued this broken man intentionally, even though he had to go through a storm to get there. There have been many Coast Guard rescues, I'm sure. One of my favorite is uh, a story captured in, um, in, the book, the Finest Hour, in the book The Finest Hours, and the movie is the same name, The Finest Hours. I love that story because it is, takes place in 1952, a true story where an oil tanker right off uh, the, the coast of Massachusetts in a great storm breaks in two, right? not down the middle, but down the m- middle horizontally so that half of the ship sinks and the other half, the stern, stays afloat in a storm with 30 men aboard. The Coast, Guard, um, the, the, the Coast Guard location there in Massachusetts, the leader of that, of that particular branch says to one of his coxswain, he says to um, a guy by the name of Bernie, he says to him, listen, Bernie, 
I want you to take a lifeboat and I want you to go out in this storm. I want you to cross over the bar and I want you to go see if you can save those people. What makes this movie work, what makes the story work is that not only are the people gonna be saved, sorry about that if you're gonna go home and watch the movie, okay? But Disney made it so you would have known they were gonna be saved anyhow, right? Not only were the people saved, but a man with two or three men in a small lifeboat has to brave a massive storm to get to them. That's what makes it powerful. For just this moment, realize, Jesus not only pursued a broken man intentionally, but he went through a storm to get there. Remember I said, it's really black, but the hope of the light is that Jesus will pursue you in the same way he pursued that man. You think you have problems? Thousands of demons? Jesus will take on a storm to get to you. And he will come to you even if you're the only reason he's crossing the lake to get to the other side. It's almost like you can read the text and everybody says, hey, hey, uh, we don't want any miracles, more miracles here. You better take off. And Jesus says, that's okay. I did what I came to do. And he looks at a man who is healed after years and years of blackness and darkness. Our Savior is strong. He pursues broken people intentionally. He exercises authority over creation. Our Savior is strong. Note this. There are two, in, there are two times in this passage that Jesus commands something. Earlier in that earlier paragraph, he commands the winds and the waves. He says, he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. I love that. I love that because I, like <clears throat> I like the water, and I like to be out on it, but I get seasick really, really quickly, okay? So to all of a sudden go from really seasick to complete peace, okay? that's how this boat is. Right? Like the boat just stops, like, like it was like a movie set, and everything was done just like that. It's a peace. And the disciples say, whoa, we were afraid of the storm. We're really afraid of who's in the boat because he commands the waves and the sea, and they stop. Not only did he command them, but he commanded the demon. Remember, when he first gets there in Luke chapter 8, he talks to the demon and, tries to, and says this demon to cast out, and the demon talks back for a little bit and argues a little bit, but sooner or later, the demon goes too, right? Jesus can exercise authority over all of creation. Why? Because your Savior's strong. You and I can't do that. When my friend Chris spoke about casting the demon out of the young girl in a... In, in Haiti, he didn't use his name, he didn't use my name, he didn't use your name. Right? There's no power in those names. Right? It's only power in the name of Jesus. He exercises authority over creation. Wherever you are in your darkness, wherever you are with the rain falling down, hold on. Jesus will come to you if you're the only one. And he will come to you with power that no one else has because he can exercise authority over all creation. I love this one. He defeats those stronger than us. Look with me again at verse 29. Verse 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. He would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. The man is not strong enough to do anything, but Jesus is, and he does. And finally, then, note this last one. He shows compassion on the hurting. Mark chapter 5, verse 19, actually ends by saying they, that Jesus commanded him to not only go and tell what had happened, but he commands him to go and tell what had happened, and he says while he's going to tell what has happened, listen, tell them how the Lord had mercy on you. Right? Like God wanted to show his mercy. But one of the fascinating things in this passage you may notice it again, that remember, this is a man who is running naked among the tombs and has done that for a long time. And when the people come back, this is what they find. Verse 35, then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Okay, this may be the only time in this man's recent life where he is sitting there, just waiting, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Here's a great question for you. 
Where did a naked man who's been naked for a long time in the tombs get his clothes? Hmm. When the people come, they see only two, Jesus and the man clothed in his right mind. Could it be that Jesus took out his outer robe and said, here, here, let me cover you up. It would make sense, wouldn't it? That Jesus would give even the clothes off his back to the man who was hurting. I just want to remind you of this. Whatever you're trapped in, whatever you're hurting, wherever your pain, there is no one that shows compassion like Jesus. No one. No one. He can not only heal what's going on inside, he can take care of what's going on outside. He does that. That's who Jesus is. He pursues broken people intentionally, even if he's got to come through a storm to get to just one. He exercises authority over creation. He is stronger than anyone you will ever know. He defeats those stronger than us because we can't. He does. And finally, when it's all said and done, he shows compassion on those who are hurting. Here, let me cover you up. It's no wonder the townspeople, when they come out, freak out. All of their life, they tried to control this man. They chained him. They'd done everything they knew how to do. Don't miss this. Everything our society attempts to do to take care of a spiritual problem cannot possibly take care of a spiritual problem. Only Jesus can do that. That's what he does. If people are afraid, we don't know what they're afraid of. Maybe they're afraid of the... uh, Maybe they're afraid of the, of the fact that they just lost an investment of 2,000 pigs that just went down and are drowned in the sea. I don't know. I don't think so, though, because if I lost an investment, I don't think I'd be afraid. I'd be angry at the person who lost my investment. Maybe they're afraid because they have just seen something they do not understand. And they know that if you actually say, Jesus did this, and that must mean he is who he claims to be, and you'll need to submit to him. Here's what I find. I find that the spiritual battle is real. I find that the Savior is stronger, and I find that most people could care less. In fact, I love the way Brooks captured it again. Ironically, they feared Jesus more than they did the demoniac and cared more for their pigs than for a fellow human being. They lost 2,000 pigs. They're more concerned about the pigs than they are about the man who is no longer chained. And don't miss this. That man is sitting right there, and for the first time in their lives, they are seeing him in his right mind. I've spoken in my lifetime to a few people who struggle with um, paranoia, schizophrenia. I know what it's like to try to interact with someone who is not in their right mind. I know how real the way that they're thinking is to them. To see them crystal clear, I've never seen that. But these townspeople, for the first time, saw this man crystal clear. I wonder, like, like, like some of them were seeing him for the first time, the one who had fought them when they chained him, fearful of him. They fought, they chained him, they chained him so that he would protect himself, so that he wouldn't run out into the desert. He burst the chains. They came back and found chains that were broken, and they found that he'd run out into the desert, destroying himself again. They had sit, their last memory of him would have been that, and now they see him sitting there peacefully, smiling. Could his parents have shown up? Could they actually have said, hey, hey, hey mom, hi, dad, it's me. The townspeople have an incredible opportunity to say, we have seen a miracle in our lifetime like we've never seen before, and we should follow. Mark wraps up this discussion this way. He says, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region, and as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him, and he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Just this morning in rereading this text again, something struck me. 
that there are three times in this story that someone begs Jesus. The demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. They didn't want to face judgment early. They said, can we go into the pigs instead? And Jesus gave them permission. They begged Jesus. The townspeople begged Jesus to depart. They didn't want anything to do with them. Only one man begs Jesus to be with him. I was wrestling with that. Like, why? Why would he beg Jesus to be with him? He's in his right mind. Is he afraid that he's going to go back the other way? That doesn't, mess with, that doesn't mesh with the story at all. The story doesn't sound like he's really fearful now that he's going to return to the same way he was before. I think he just begs Jesus to be with him because of his deep sense of gratitude. I just want to be with you. Because... When you have lived through the darkness and a strong Savior has reached down and taken you out, would you ever want to be anyplace else? Hmm. Jesus says, let me give you a command. Here's how you can be with me. Go and tell your friends. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Can, can, like, can, can you imagine that story? Who's coming for dinner tonight? Oh, you know, so-and-so. <laughs> I'm not coming in the house if he's coming. Right. Oh, no, he's changed. Right. You need to come to dinner and hear a story. And you come into the table, and you see at the table this man who is in his right mind. Maybe you can even still see some of the traces of the scars where he had cut himself. And he begins to tell you about what he knew in the darkness and what he knows in the light. Because Jesus reached down and took him. I think at the end of every story, he says it the same way. I was so undeserving, but Jesus had mercy on me. Wow. I told you, it's one of the saddest, most beautiful and when you see the townspeople, most disappointing stories you'll ever read in the Bible, here's my question. Do you find yourself today in the position of the demoniac, the one who is under the darkness saying, this is really, really hard, and you've got to look to a strong Savior? Do you find yourself maybe detached as one of the townspeople saying, oh, I know I should do more, but, you know, you aren't caught up and captured in what Jesus Christ saved you from. In both cases, we need to look to the Savior because he's a strong Savior and because he came through a storm intentionally just for you. Know that in your pain. You bow your heads with me. I'm going to ask our worship team to come and they'll close us with a song this morning. As they're coming, um, Maybe you've just never really thought about how desperate your situation was. And this morning, the Spirit of God began to prick that. and He began to address that in your life. I just want to remind you, don't bury that and walk out of the room today. Right? Take a moment, maybe at the close of the service or something right now, and just say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I'm scared. I'm fearful. I'm frightened. I'm tired of the rain but I'm surrendering this to you. Maybe you've never heard this incredible truth that Jesus left heaven and came to earth like that's a storm, right? He lived here beaten, accused, falsely represented, and then died so that his death on a cross could pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. And he would have done that just only for you. Maybe this morning you just need to take the phrase the world out of John 3, 16 and put your name in. It would sound like this. For God so loved, put your name in the blank, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes, take out whosoever, put your name in the blank, believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. Simply believe, not in yourself, but in Jesus and what he did. Maybe this morning you're a little calloused and you would acknowledge that like the townspeople, you don't really necessarily embrace or engage your Christianity deeply. 
Maybe you sometimes have even said to Jesus, okay, Lord, that's enough, but from here on out, I need you to depart. I don't want you messing with this part of my life. Hey, don't say that anymore. Recognize the story of the man who sat before Jesus and knew his mercy and was in his right mind and never again returned to what he had known before. Trust the Lord with whatever you're facing. Father, we are thankful for the power of your spirit to use your word and take it and engage our lives and help us see things that we otherwise wouldn't have known. And we're thankful that your word is just kind of not some stoic book of stories, but it's alive. And we know that because when we hear it opened and we begin to look at it, we realize it's messing with our hearts. It's It's causing us to see things about ourselves that we thought no one knew and your Holy Spirit knows and you use the word to change us. I pray, Lord, that you reach into our lives this morning and do that. May it not just be a temporary change, but may it be the first step, even if it's just a small step, to the kind of change that only you can bring. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.